The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. The, the, the topic for lecture for the next couple of days um, is going to be um, romantic love or, or mating behavior or the interaction thereof or something like that. And I just learned that the Shakespeare Ensemble is doing, uh, uh, doing Taming of the Shrew. Uh, when? Uh, tonight, tomorrow night, and Saturday at? 8 o'clock. Where? Little Kresge Theater. We should probably assign it, you know, like as homework or something like that. But... Uh, but you, you can go, after today's lecture, you can go and try to apply evolutionary psychological theory to um, Taming of the Shrew, if you like. And you can tell Bianca how you liked it. Um, all right. Enough Shakespeare. Shakespeare shows up again, maybe later today. Shh. Uh, let, me, let me tell you a... Um, Let me tell you about Chris and Terry here who are having an argument. Um, I realize this is a sort of a working memory exercise too, so you have to pay attention uh, to the particular details here. So Chris and Terry are having an argument. Um, they, they, they've been going together for about a year. Um, they don't live together. They do sleep together. Chris accuses Terry, so Chris accuses Terry of seeing someone else on the side. Terry doesn't want to talk about it. Chris says that Terry never wants to talk about anything. Um, Terry shouts that, well, maybe there is somebody else on the side, and says, well, it's not like there's been much activity in this relationship lately anyway. And... <laughs> Chris snorts that there's more to a relationship than just sex. All right? You got that? And you will have noticed, even Kristen, who stayed up all night cheering the Red Sox, will have noticed that Chris and Terry are deliberately um, ambiguous as to the sex of, of who's who. Um, they could, of course, be the same sex, um, and that reminds me to say ahead of time, I'm going to talk almost exclusively for the next two days, uh, next two lectures, about heterosexual relationships. Lots of fascinating stuff to say uh, about same-sex relationships, like so many topics in introductory psych, it's just one I'm not going to get to. So if we assume that Chris and Terry are... Um, uh, are, are male and female. One of them is male and one of them is female. Um, now I don't remember which side I was gesturing to, so I don't remember. Was this Chris or Terry? That was Terry. This was Chris. Okay, so um, how many people vote that Terry is uh, the male person? How many vote that uh, Chris is the male person? How many vote that I got lost in the details and I can't remember who's who anymore? All right, well, anyway, quick, quick, quick review. Uh, Chris accuses Terry of seeing someone on the side. Terry doesn't want to talk about it. Chris says Terry never wants to talk. Terry shouts that there may be somebody on the side and there hasn't been much activity. And Chris says there's more to a relationship than sex. Um, how many vote Terry is male? How many vote Chris is male? Uh, gee, there seems to be a fairly strong asymmetry there, which is capturing something of the, the cliché that, um, you know, men are just interested in sex and women are interested in commitment or something like that. This is a sort of a cartoon version. Recognizing that actually we sort of backed off what I was saying last time about talking about individual differences and now we're talking about on average Again, recognizing that there's vast variations in, um, uh, in, in relationships between men and women. Is there any truth to this sort of asymmetry? If there is, how in the world would you explain it? Um, that's, that's the job for uh, today's lecture. Well, I mean, there's lots of anecdotal evidence. How about a little bit of, of data evidence from... Um, from one of my favorite experiments in the uh, 
um, uh, in the annals of experiments that you can't see how they ever got it passed. Oh, does it say IRB on the handout? IRB stands for Institutional Review Board. Um, dear, you don't have to worry about that bit of jargon, but th- those are the people who um, look at experimental protocols and decide whether it's uh, permissible to do this. So, you know, if, if you volunteer to be a subject in our lab, please do. We need subjects. Talk to Kristen. Um, anyway, if you do, we'll have you sign a seven-page consent form because um, they're really worried about the damage we can do to you looking at little red and green bars on a computer screen. So you have to imagine how this experiment ever got past... Uh, uh, the IRB, um, though it does seem like a good one for reality TV, perhaps. Anyway, so here you are. You're wandering around on campus, and an attractive member of the opposite sex approaches you and asks you one of these three questions. I should note that I was explaining this to my wife this morning, and she got confused and thought this was a multiple-choice test. It's not a multiple-choice test, which would be even weirder. Um, but it's, it's a... So the, 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 the percentages don't need to add up to 100. Um, that, that's important. But this person comes up to you and asks you either... Oh, so, so it says something to the effect of, you know, I've, I've seen you around campus, and, and, and you, you, you're, uh, you're really an attractive person. Um, would you go on a date with me? That's question one. Would you come back to my uh, apartment with me? Or would you have sex with me? And um, what, what, what I can't find out is the sec- what happens after the subject gives an answer. <laughs> Right, you know, it's uh, th- th- this is this is a quite famous experiment, but the original experiment is published in a very obscure journal, and I don't actually have a copy of the of the um, article. Uh, so we've got um, these three questions: there's the date question, the apartment question, and the uh, and and the sex question. Um, and uh, so we'll. Plot percent yes here. Okay, if you are a woman person, um, what do you think, what, what percentage of women said, yes, I'll go on a date with you, would you think? 50%. What? 50%. Is the, that, that sounded terribly authoritative. Is that because it's written down in the book or something? Because I read it. You read it. The, 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 the exp- but it's not in Gleitman, is it? No, it's on the website. It's on the website. It's on the website. Oh, the article's on the website? Yeah. Did I... Wait a second. I thought I didn't find the original article. What? Oh, okay. Well, 50%. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, uh, this, whoops, 50% doesn't go all the way up the... Yeah, okay. 50%. This kind of takes the, uh, the guesswork out of it a bit. <laughs> Oh, well, I was kind of... guy. I, I thought we could find out if you memorized all the percentages. <laughs> or, so, all right. If you're, not, if you're not the good person who went and read everything on the website. <laughs> all right. How many, how many women do you think were willing to go back to the guy's apartment? <laughs> Two, nine sounds great. The average is about six. <laughs> nah. So, 50, six... Number, percentage of women who w- said, sure, I will have sex with you. Zero. Z- z- zero would be a good... <laughs> so, now, that's a, the, the IRB, or, or so, so the, 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 the sequel issue here that you'd love to know the answer to is how many times the guy got, like, punched or reported to the campus police or something. But now... Oop, do I have any colored chalk? No, we'll just have to go for hatched bars today. So that's the female data. Let's, whoop, let's, let's start at the other end here. What percentage of guys approached by a woman who said, I think you're attractive, would you like to have sex? Said yes. She said she wasn't going to be answering anymore. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's 75%. <laughs> It's also interesting. It's it's also interesting to see what happens with the rest of the questions. If you ask, 
Would you go back to the apartment with me? That drops to about, I think, 67%. And if you ask, um, you know, would you go on a date with me? It drops to 50. So not only... Now, now look, the world is full of interesting asymmetries in data. And, and, and even, even sex differences. You know, sex differences in, say, you know, mathematical ability or something like that. Sex differences in most stuff look like this. This. You know, there's a data point with an error bar, and there's another data point with an error bar, and you say, oh yeah, look, there's a significant sex difference if we run eight and a half million subjects. You don't get data like this most of the time. This is like a huge asymmetry. So one interesting question is, why is this huge? Um, and another interesting question is this um, apparently counterintuitive slope to the male data where you're more likely if you're a guy to say oh sure I'll have sex with you right now um, but I don't actually want to go on a date with you um, which is on the face of it perhaps a little odd but we'll come back to try to explain that um, there are multiple ways so th this is not some weird isolated data point where, where you know, people just did a very odd, it's an odd experiment. Here, this is the one that you really wonder about what the next sentence was. You know, hi, you're very attractive, would you have sex with me? Oh yes, sure. Just kidding. Um, you know, it's, it's a very odd experiment, but a very interesting one. Yeah, Mara knows the answer to the rest of the... They control for the attractiveness of the questioner, right? Well, the description, my, my, my expert witness can probably tell me better because she's read this more recently, apparently. The description, I think, is simply that the, 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 uh, the experimenter, the experimenter's confederate is described as being attractive. But, but at, look, do the intuition. You can only do the real intuition for the sex that you happen to belong to. But ask yourself, you know, really attractive guy comes up and says, would you like to have sex with me right now? Do you think the point moves a lot off zero? And, and short of, um, you know, I don't know, non-human woman. <laughs> It's not clear how much that point moves either. I, the, um, I, I don't know. And it's not one of these things. I, I also, by the way, I do not recommend, um, you know, when you go off into, course 15 seems to be the place where they like to do, you know, survey experiments and stuff like that. I don't recommend this one as one to try because I really do think that it's hard to imagine how to do this without getting into serious trouble. Fascinating, fascinating as the experiment is. Um, other efforts for it to, to get at the same point have been done um, in sort of more indirect fashion. So you can, you can be your subject in this one, um, which was one where you were asked to rate a variety of um, uh, events as being uh, uh, positive or negative, affectively positive or negative if this happened. And, 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 and the, uh, the most salient one seems to me to be one where uh, the description was you're on a crowded subway car. Uh, an attractive member of the sex to which you are attracted um, begins to surreptitiously touch you on the subway car. Is this a positive or a negative event? The answer in the, in the data is women overwhelmingly say, ooh, you know, that's kind of creepy and, and negative. This is not good. And guys fairly overwhelmingly say, yeah, what's the problem here? The, um, this, so, you know, again, you get a hugely asymmetrical um, result. And, and what we want to do is try to account for that asymmetry. Now, um, assuming that you have not been entirely comatose for the first half of the course, you will recognize that the broad classes of explanation are going to be nature-nurture kinds of things, and, and of course it's always a combination. In particular, today what I'm going to talk about is um, a, a biological account, in, and, and that's the account coming out of evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology, the application of evolutionary theory to uh, topics in psychology is very uh, prevalent, very important these days. Um, it gets applied 
to a huge range of topics, some of which it probably doesn't have much to say about. But if there's anything that it's got a lot to say about, it's probably human mating behavior. Um, and, um, and so that's why I'll talk about evolutionary psychology in this particular, um, this particular context. This is not to say it's the only way of accounting for mating behavior, but it's a particularly, I think it's very hard to argue that, that uh, these sort of biological forces don't have some shaping influence on, um, on the way that we select mates, and I, and, and I want to try cashing out that argument today. If you want to read more about it, um, there are several, uh, I, I put reference to several books on the, on the handout, um, all of which I put on there because they're both, uh, you know, they, they, they talk about the topic, but they're all good reads. My current favorite, actually, is the Baumeister and uh, Tice one. It, it's less of one of the ones that's sort of been on the bestseller list, but it's a beautifully written uh, book on this topic if, you're, if you are if you're interested. Um, all right, so let, let, let's run down the basic um, evolutionary psych argument and then attempt to see um, how it might account for the sort of data that we see in this, um, this area. Um, if you are operating within uh, this sort of evolutionary framework, your goal as an organism is to do what? Pass on your genes. You got to propagate your genes in some fashion. Um, you got to, um, yeah, 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 you, you want to get that genetic material into future generations. And, and, and how are you going to do that? Weren't you paying attention in high school? <laughs> there are several ways, but, the, but sexual reproduction is considered perhaps the most direct of these. <laughs> it's not the only one, by the way. It's important to point out. Um, that uh, it's not the if, if you think that again by the way all of this stuff is presumably operating at a very unconscious implicit kind of level nobody assumes that people are wandering around um, you know uh, the, the dating scene saying gotta pass on my genes how am I going to do that um, but the forces the forces that are, are shaping that behavior are, pres uh, are within this viewpoint um, shaped by this, this drive to pass on genetic material into, into the next generation. You can also um, propagate your genes by taking care of um, your relations. So if, you are, uh, uh, if you've got a, a, a brother or sister with kids, those kids are genetically related to you. And if you nurture them, if you pay for their college education or something, they're not as genetically related to you as your own children, but they're genetically related to you. And so you can do the propagation thing indirectly rather than through uh, just uh, you know, regular old-fashioned uh, sexual reproduction. This, by the way... Um, is one of the uh, arguments offered by evolutionary psychologists um, for the persistence of same-sex relations. Same-sex relationships are a problem from this evolutionary point of view because they don't lead to offspring, right? Whatever else is going on, they don't lead, um, they don't lead to offspring. And so one of the... I don't know if there's any data for it. I've never... I've, perhaps because I haven't looked... Um, but one of the arguments that has been uh, put forward uh, from time to time are things like, oh, gay men make great uncles, right? Yeah, they, 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 they're not going to have kids of their own, but they take care of their sister's kids. And that's why it's, uh, it's, it's not selected out, it's not selected against um, by, uh, by evolution. Um, in any case, sticking with this sort of uh, mainline tale... You want to propagate your genes. Sexual reproduction is a, is a good way to do it. Um, now, uh, the thing about sex is uh, you get pregnant. Actually, only half of you get pregnant. Um, it was sort of an ambiguous sentence. Uh, it, this is half of you, plural, get pregnant, not half of you as an individual get <laughs> pregnant if you... you... You never know what people learn in high school. Um, in any case... It is that fact, that's the key fact in this story, um, that produces the asymmetry. Women get pregnant, men don't get pregnant. Why is that important? Well, that's important because being pregnant ties you up 
for nine months, being pregnant for nine months at a time, greatly is, 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 is a uh, profound rate-limiting step on how many kids you can have. And then, if you're a, a, a human and, and uh, not, not a, a spider or something like that, once the kid is born or hatched or whatever, you still got a problem here. You want this little bundle of genes to do something for you in evolutionary terms, you got to keep it alive. So it's not just the nine months. There's a long time, long term commitment to this little evolutionary project that you've gotten into. The same constraints do not necessarily apply to men. Certainly the rate limiting step does not apply because in principle, guys can go off and have a gazillion babies, that's a technical term, um, as long as they can find the requisite gazillion women. Right, that's the rate limiting step for men is just how many women can you successfully impregnate. Um, now th- th- we're talking in, th- we're not talking in what is right in, in social civilized world or something like that, right? But we're just talking about the biology of the situation here. The men don't get pregnant. If, if uh, you get woman one pregnant today, you can get woman two pregnant tomorrow in principle. That's not true for the woman. If you are a woman and you get pregnant today, you don't get to get pregnant again tomorrow. Right? That doesn't work. So, fundamental difference. The evolutionary psych argument is that this should produce fundamental differences in behavior. In particular, if your goal is to get as many successful bundles of genes into the next generation as possible, guys should be inclined to have sex early and often with as many partners as possible because that's going to produce lots and lots of babies. Women should be looking for something more like commitment because it's a lot easier to take care of this little bundle of joy if somebody else is helping out. Either helping take care of the, uh, the kid or at the very least providing resources for this. Right? It, it's an expensive business raising a kid. Not just an expensive business if you, you know, you're a nice middle class kid and you're expecting to go to MIT or something like that. It's an expensive business period. You've got to feed the kid. You've got to keep it warm and so on. Resources are required and you, it is in your interest as, as the woman to have, um, to have guys around, or at least a guy around, who's going to provide uh, resources. Now, you can make up other stories. You could make up a story that says it would be in the woman's interest to have multiple mates um, who are kept in some doubt about who the father is so that they all provide resource. Um, now, it sounds funny, but there's no reason why that story... And th- th- there are species where that seems to... Um, you, know, where that, you can almost always find an animal where it works out. If, if humans were a polyandrous species, a species where females had um, multiple mates... Um, at the same time, that, that would require explanation and you could try explaining it in the same terms. As it turns out, um, in, uh, you know, you, across cultures, the pattern is either one male, one female, or um, uh, one male, several females. There, there are much rarer instances of one female, um, many males in, in, in human populations. Um, so, the mainline story is that the, the, the constraints of biology are going to incline uh, the population to a population of males who are interested um, in frequent sex and, uh, and, and, you know, whenever, and women who are going to be looking for uh, a mate who's, going to, who's willing to make some sort of commitment. Now, is there any evidence for... Um, evolutionary forces, biological constraints on mate selection in humans, quite apart from these questions about, uh, you know, who wants sex and when. Are there any, is there any evidence for this um, at all? Uh, the answer is yes, and, and, and in, if I give some examples, it, it, it's sort of surprising that this was ever controversial. Um, so, well, let's give an example. For example... If you're looking for evidence that something has these sort of biological evolutionary roots, what you're looking for is something that is um, uh, ubiquitous in human societies. You don't want something 
where um, uh, you know, it's deemed attractive in one population or desirable in one population and not in another population, that could be very culturally determined. So uh, I, I don't know of much in the way of great evolutionary psych arguments in favor of which bits of your body should be pierced. Right, that, that, that's, that, that seems to be the sort of thing that uh, yeah, some, some groups think this is attractive and some groups think that is attractive. And yeah, yeah. But across human cultures, there is a consistent preference for mates who are young and healthy as opposed to mates who are old and sick. There is no place where um, the, the ideal of attractiveness is, um, is an old person with a disease. It just isn't the case. Now, it, it almost sounds funny, but, um, but well, you know, I, I, I got a house full of books. I like to collect books. It turns out that the books I like best are pretty old and diseased. And, and that's not weird, right? That, that doesn't strike people as, as odd. Um, there, you do need to explain, it doesn't take much work to explain, why there's a preference for young, healthy mates over old, diseased mates. If you think that this has something to do with a, a drive towards reproduction, you're much more likely to reproduce successfully with a young, healthy mate. Um, the, contra- the, the reason that these topics have been controversial has less to do with the science of the situation, or has had less to do with the science of the situation than with the politics of the situation. It is possible, as in the IQ case, to go from um, uncontroversial or, or fairly straightforward bits of science to, um, to undesirable or at least controversial conclusions in, in a more political realm. So the sorts of things... If you agree, if you, know, if, if you are forced by the data to say, look, there's a whopping asymmetry between males and females in, in this area, it is perhaps, the concern is that it's a slippery slope from you know, here to saying, well, it's okay to pay women less than men. The, the, the actual causal chain between this particular factoid and paying women less than men is not immediately obvious to me as I'm saying it right here. But the, the reason that this was politically, it is politically controversial is because anything that acknowledges a difference, some sort of biological difference between, say, men and women, can in principle be used as a defense for social inequalities that you may, want, that you may not find desirable. Um, but that's really a separate question. The, the, the scientific question, or the psychological question, is are there differences? There certainly seem to be d- data differences, and, 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 and where, do they, where do they come from? Um, so, uh, if you ask, there, there, are other, there are other sort of universal preferences that seem to reflect this desire for um, a mate who is likely to be um, uh, a, a, a good partner in reproduction. So there is a... What what is it that makes a face attractive? Well, one of the things that is attractive is facial symmetry. That all all else being equal, um, it's considered to be better. You're considered to be more attractive. A face is rated as more attractive if it's symmetrical than if it's asymmetrical. Why is that? Most of the things that are likely to produce noticeable asymmetries in, um, in the face are, um, uh, are things that suggest either um, a uh, genetic deformity of some sort or, or an accident. Neither of which are strong, uh, you know, the, 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 neither of them are going to be great uh, advertisements for um, reproductive success. Right? You imagine somebody with half a face. There's some, you, you know intuitively that either you're watching a sci-fi movie or there's something fundamentally, um, fundamentally wrong here. Oh, what is an attractive face in general is, 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 a, in, is an interesting... I didn't put all those references on the handout. Um, there's an interesting literature on what makes an attractive face that, that uh, um, is worth a little side note. Uh, this uh, one theory is that what is attractive um, is not... You, you, you could have two theories. One theory would be attractive is one end of a scale that runs from ugly to gorgeous. 
right? And that all those Hollywood actors and actresses are pegged out here on the gorgeous end of some, some scale. Um, what, um, the, the alternative theory is that it is um, average faces, the, the, and that an average face is what's normal, is what's deemed attractive. And the, um, the, the evidence for this, the original evidence for this comes from a photographic technique where what you did was you took a whole bunch of photographs and superimposed them to make a composite face and you found that those were rated as more attractive than individual faces um, as, as a whole. And this, this was being done by, by clever techniques back, oh, I think, you know, in early part of the 20th century. Um, and it, it's, it's gotten a lot easier now that we've got computers to, to, to do these sort of things. The difficulty, one of the things that made this uh, research a little tricky is that one thing that averaging faces does is it does wonders for your complexion. Hmm. Nobody, you know, there, there are just not... Uh, you know, your no, everybody's nose is in more or less the same place, but everybody's zit is not. And so if you average 100 faces, you get people with gorgeous complexions. And there's some part of that effect that just comes from the fact that um, they look like they had really healthy skin. Um, the, it's a debate that jumps back and forth. If you turn out to be deeply interested in, in what makes a face attractive, send me a note. I'll send you the, uh, the references since I see I didn't put them on the, uh, on the handout. Um, we can ask for a couple of other things that, that suggest these universals across human populations. Um, on average, if uh, uh, what, what's, what, what's more desirable in a mate? Uh, richer or poorer? Richer, that's easy enough. Um, is that preference the same for men and women? Who wa- who, who's more interested in finding... I'll tell you the answer. Uh, it's not the same. Um, how many vote that, uh, that it's men who are more interested in finding a wealthy mate? How many vote that it's women? You got the right intuition. And the evolutionary psych story there is the resource story. That what you're looking for is evidence of, of uh, resource. You know, does this guy, is this guy going to help me uh, feed all those hundreds of babies that he thinks we're going to have? Um, the, uh, and, and this is also presumed to be uh, the, you know, wh- wh- why, why is it that driving, you know, cruising around town in the fancy car, you know, what's that about? That's a peacock tail Effect. I think I already described the peacock tail effect uh, earlier in the course. The idea is, you know, I'm showing off my resources. I've got so much money that I can buy this stupid car. My hubcaps cost more than your house. Um, which is why you want to mate with me. Yeah, it, it, this, is, this, is, this is presumed to be the way that the... Okay, um, how about age of, uh, of spouse? Or age, age, of, age of mate? Um, on average, if you are a male, you want a, uh, and uh, this, is, this is very importantly on average, because it's not to say you're sitting there, uh, well, let's get the data point first. Um, if, if you're a male, on average, how many people vote that you are looking for a mate who is, uh, well, this is a three alternative force choice, so you've got to vote for one of them. Little older, exactly the same age, little younger. How many vote for little older? How many vote for just the same age? How many vote for a little younger? Okay, you got that intuition right. Um, the, uh, so males, uh, on average, in culture after culture, seek mates who are a little younger. The amount varies culturally. In some cultures, you, it's significantly younger. In some cultures, it, it's, it's uh, only uh, a couple of years. But it is a cross-culture uh, um, Younger. Um, oh, and okay, so the point I was going to make before is you're sitting there saying, my girlfriend is like two years older than me. This does not mean that you are some sort of genetic misfit. <laughs> it means that we're back to talking about the mean value and all of these things have a, a distribution around them. Um, it would be considered odd... If your choice in, um, uh, in mates was 
I only date women who are 60 years older than me. <laughs> you know, that would be considered unusual. Um, but, you know, that needs to be way, way out on one tail of it. But, but tip, typically, the mean of that, that, that distribution lies a little younger. Okay, let's ask, okay, why is that the case? If you're following this evolutionary psych story, why do males seek females who are slightly younger? More babies. More babies, right? This is a... There's this, the, the, the males may not be limited in principle by the same rate limiting step, but if you're in a culture that's going to limit you to one woman, you better get one woman who's going to produce the maximum number of babies. Um, so you better start young and, 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 okay, so if you are a woman, same multiple choice. Um, if you are a woman, the average, uh, w- across cultures, women prefer, um, how many vote that women prefer males who are slightly older? S- exactly the same age, slightly younger. You got the right intuition. Again, it's very convenient that this is the way it works out. It's really bad news if everybody wants younger mates, right? There, there, there's going to be a, that doesn't work well. Um, but actually, we'll come back to that in, in, uh, in the next lecture. I'll just put that out there uh, as a problem to solve. Everybody does want um, the, the, to, to max out you know, on, on the attractive, you know, attractive, rich, gorgeous thing. Um, but most of us aren't going to get that, right? There's got to be some... So if, if, if it's one male to one female, roughly speaking, we can't all have that person. It just isn't going to work well. So we'll, we'll, try, we'll have to solve that next week. Um, okay, why do, ma- why do females want males who are slightly older? Maturity. Maturity, good luck. Um, <laughs> the, the, evolutionary, the evolutionary psych argument is, 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 the, is the resource argument. I'm sure maturity doesn't hurt either. Um, but uh, but it's, it's, the, it's the resource argument. A guy has, more ta- has had a chance to accumulate more resource if he's um, a little older. And, and so you've got these endless, um, sometimes literally endless, big, thick 19th century romance uh, you know, novels that you read in English lit at some point where um, you know, he loves her, but they can't get together for 800 pages because he's got to go out and collect resource in some fashion until he can come back and tell, uh, you know, show daddy that, that he can support the, 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 the daughter. Uh, the, the alternative version of the 19th century romance is the interview where daddy asks um, how much money your daddy left you. Right? Oh yes, I have a hundred thousand, you know, no, no, a thousand dollars, a thousand pounds, they're all English novels, a thousand pounds a year in the funds or something like that. That's resource. That's good. Um, anyway, uh, oh, there's one exception. There is a population of males who seek slightly older women. Who is that population? Exactly. <laughs> There's this cruel, sick chortle that I just, we just got from a, from a... All the answers given to that were by women, all of whom were, were snickering about it. Um, which is harsh. Um, but it, it is, it, it's teenage males, particularly young teenage males, who develop um, crushes on slightly older, or maybe quite a bit older, women. Why? What's that about? They're fertile. They're fertile, exactly. Now, I mean, the kid doesn't know this, right? Again, this is, yeah. Oh, I think I'd better fall in love with somebody who's fertile. You know, it's, that's presumably not what's operating at any sort of conscious level here. But if your goal is, you know, if, 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 if evolutionary forces are driving you to look for a mate who's going to be fertile, and you're, you know, an early adolescent male, nine-year-old girls are not the population of choice. Um, and, and, and you will notice, you may notice that, 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 that even the example gives you a sort of a ooh kind of feeling. We have a sort of a gut built-in reaction that there are some relationships that are okay and some relationships that are odd. And, and so relationships, and, and in, in particular... Um, Relationships, uh, guys can go and pursue 
fertile females. That's okay. That can be shown in an airline movie. Right? And, and, and again, we don't have the airline movie, you know, the headline comes up, the search for the fertile woman. Um, but, you know, ask yourself who it is who romantic comedies are about. You wouldn't put a movie on, on, on the airline for family consumption about some guy's uh, unrequited passion for a nine-year-old girl. It would seem icky, right? That there's something wrong there. Um, and... Um, why? Presumably, this has something to do with these, the, the same sort of uh, the same sort of forces. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's move on a bit uh, to this. Uh, elaborate on this issue a bit. Who should be faithful in relations? Who should cheat? Um, so let's start with guys. Now, now, now r- r- recognize here, by the way, that we are talking again within the context of this evolutionary psych uh, viewpoint. We are not saying who should cheat in your relationship right now with the person sitting next to you or something like that. Or who does society say it's okay to cheat with? But in terms of this theory about evolutionary forces working on mate selection, who should have an evolutionary drive to cheat? Should guys? Yeah, right? That's a pretty straightforward um, argument that, that if you can get away with it, if you can have a few no-cost babies somewhere, great, you've done your evolutionary work. You may be, you know, look, if we switch to a different context of, of sort of uh, cultural, civilized world kind of, you may be a jerk, but you're, you're an evolutionary, evolutionarily successful jerk, I suppose would be. Okay, how about women? Should women, should women um, uh, be unfaithful and, 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 and play around? Yes. What's, what, okay, the yes argument. Why, what, what's the yes argument? Again, from an evolutionary point of view. You might get a stronger mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you might get a stronger mate. You're, you're hedging your genetic bets. Right? So if you are going to be... If you, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, link up with this, this guy. Maybe he turns out to be a genetic dud. If you just have your 18 babies with him, you know, how good is that? Um, But if you spread it around a bit, you know, your genes are the same in all cases. Who cares, right? You're always getting your half of the package. And so you might as well mix it up a bit. And and, and so that's the that's the that's the yes argument or that's a a, um, yes argument. Um, What about a uh, what? Oh, uh, any, any other yes arguments? There are, yep. Uh, you could uh, have sex with a guy who has better genes, but uh, we're really more faithful with a guy with more resources. Ah, yes, okay. So this is a, a, a particular version of the more general argument. There's a resource argument here. He, he, he's giving a particular version, which is go have sex with the guy with the good genes and schnooker the guy with the good resources, <laughs> right? And, and convince him that it's his kid, so he devotes the resources to raise his genes, Right. At, uh, more generally, you might um, uh, you might just play around, uh, you know, shop around because you get more resources in general. Right. The guys will give you stuff in some fashion or other. So there might be an ec- sort of a quasi economic go out and get the goodies kind of uh, uh, kind of argument. Okay. Those are those are good yes arguments. How about no arguments? Um, against the notion of, of, of uh, uh, yeah. You could lose the resources. Why would you lose the resources? What's the guy's problem? It's not his kid. Um, and this is a crucial issue. Um, it, again, it, it, this is a, a, another part of this fundamental asymmetry. Because it's the woman who gets presi- uh, pregnant, right? The woman <laughs> who gets pregnant she always knows who the mother is. Actually, he knows who the mother is too. There's no doubt about who the mother is. So, the maternal, the maternal genes are not an issue here. Paternal genes are an issue. And, um, and doubts about paternity have a variety of, uh, of consequences. Um, male sexual jealousy is, is a, a real and, and, and potentially dangerous phenomenon 
In fact, it, 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 it's, uh, I don't think there are any states where it's still the case. Um, for in, there were states where it was the case that killing an unfaithful wife was not murder. Um, it was never the, I, I don't think it was ever the other way around. You couldn't kill your unfaithful husband. But killing the unfaithful wife um, was, you know, it wasn't necessarily a laudable act, but it wasn't murder in the way that killing somebody else um, was. I don't believe that. Anybody happen to know that they come from a state where you can still do that with impunity? I think Louisiana. I think Louisiana was the last. Um, but in any case, um, oh, and there, there are interesting wrinkles. There are interesting wrinkles on this. If you, um, when when a baby is born, the first question anybody asks is, is it a boy or a girl? Which is an interesting factoid in its own right. Um, but the sort of the second topic of conversation is who does the kid look like? And what's the answer? The answer is um, a bias towards saying that the kid looks like the father. Now why should that be the case? Um, and it turns out that the bias is strong. If it depends who's giving the answer. The answer um, by the wife's family, by the mother's family, is more skewed towards saying it looks like the father. Um, and there, there, are, there are at least two reasons why this is the case. One of them seems to be an effort, again, quite unconscious, to prove to the dad, you don't have to say it looks like the mother, we know who the mother is. Saying it looks like the father is reassuring to the father who might otherwise deny resource to this kid. Or go out and kill the mother or something inconvenient like that. Right? So it's important to believe that this is your bundle of genes. The guy is in, in theoretical doubt. The woman is not in doubt. The other reason why it may be true is there is some evidence that um, babies actually look more like their fathers when they're young. And that this wears off with age. Um, I, th- this, if this is true, it, it would be an interesting argument for this evolutionary pressure... Because babies who looked clearly like dad probably had a little edge. Because dad looked at this little bundle of joy and said, It's mine! And if the, you know, the kid looked like the milkman or something, um, you know, the kid may not have... Actually, I don't can even use that as an example anymore. Are there still milkmen out there? It used to be. It's, it's, an anachr- it's a sort of an anachronism like talking about dialing the phone. It's a, the, 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 this, is a, this is a very mid-50s kind of cl- uh, 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 anachronistic sort of cliche about you know, the woman who would be at home, the milkman who would be the man who delivered the milk, um, since you didn't go to the supermarket to buy milk. It came to your house, um, and then various other things happened. And, you know, anyway... <laughs> So much for, for, for cultural enlightenment here. Um, so, in any case, there's a pressure for women to be faithful um, because of the, uh, basically, in, in some fashion, because of the danger of alienating the male in, in, uh, in some way or... Um, in some way or other. Um, the, uh, there's a problem here. A sort of a problem. There, 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 there's a, a potential problem with this. If you think about it, we've just come up with a theory that explains why women should be faithful or sh- and shouldn't be faithful. And in fact, we could elaborate on this and, and um, say that the evolutionary pressures uh, should uh, cause... The, you, know, you, you, you could argue that the evolutionary pressures could push women to have less of a sex drive, therefore making them more likely to remain faithful, or you could have it explained that they have just the same sex drive, but they're supposed to deny the existence. You could have a lot of different explanations. Um, and this is a problem. If you, this is a problem with a theory. A theory that explains all possible outcomes um, isn't a great theory. On the other hand... In human, be- in human mating behavior, all the possible outcomes are out there. 
Um, so you don't want to have a theory that just explains one thing because that wouldn't be an adequate theory here either. Um, I, I think the fairer thing to say about evolutionary theory is that um, it hasn't reached a degree of sophistication where it can explain in detail um, when a woman should or should not be faithful. Um, there are examples elsewhere of these sort of trade-off situations that, that, that uh, evolutionary sorts of theories explain rather well. So a, an example, um, sort of in the same ballpark, comes from cuckoos. You know about cuckoos? Cuckoos are nasty birds. Cuckoos like to lay their eggs in somebody else's nest because... This business of raising kids is resource intensive, and if you can get somebody else to do it, great. So cuckoos lay their eggs in somebody else's next nest, and it gets better from there um, because um, the cuckoo egg hatches early, and the cuckoo chick has this lovely reflex where what it does is it arches its little cuckoo back and kicks the other eggs out. So it kills off its, um, its adopted siblings, and, and then it sits there making I'm hungry noises and gets fed by genetically unrelated birds. Um, now, this is, the, the, there's an obvious problem here. It's in the cuckoo's interest to do this, but you can't have too many cuckoos. If cuckoos do this to every nest, then there's no next generation, right? Because there's nobody left dumb enough to raise your kids in the next generation. So there's an equilibrium. You you can write down equations for this um, that say a a, a healthy population can tolerate this many cuckoos, this many cheaters. You might ask, by the way, why the, 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 the stupid bird, the stupid sparrow or whatever, who's got a cuckoo in his nest her nest, doesn't say, get out of here. Um, and the problem seems to be um, that, uh, that the cuckoo behaves as a sort of a super normal baby stimulus. That, you know, you, 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 you as a, uh, a mommy sparrow or a daddy sparrow, you are built to say, oh, look at that, it's cute, it's a baby, I want to feed it. And, and, and your success is whether this thing is growing. And here's this honking, huge cuckoo baby. Wow, I hit the jackpot. I got the greatest baby in the world. It doesn't happen to be genetically related to me, um, but it's a great baby. And so I stuff it full of worms. Um, the, last year there was an article about a species of, I don't remember what, but some other non-cuckoo bird that has learned now how to recognize, or you know, has, has evolved the ability to recognize um, the, uh, the cuckoos, and you can't lay your cuckoo eggs in those nests because that uh, species will get rid of you and, and, and preserve their own. But anyway, you've got to have a, there's an equilibrium state here. You have a balance that tolerates a certain amount of cheating and not... A, the same thing happens in human, um, human relationships, um, though the, the, uh, the details are much more complicated to work out. But um, do people lie? Yeah, sure. Right? Do people lie all the time? No, you can't do that. You can't have an arbitrary relationship between truth and... Utterances cannot have arbitrary truth value because then there wouldn't be any point to communication. So on average, people as a whole have to tell the truth. Does everybody have to tell the same amount of truth? No. The population can tolerate some amount of real liars, right? Right? pathological, lying through their teeth all the time. Oh yes, I love you, baby. I will devote all my resources to you, liars. Um, or whatever, whatever realm it is. But again, there's going to be an equilibrium equation there somewhere, not as well worked out as with cuckoos, that says we can only tolerate so many liars. If every... So, you could ask the question, is there motivation for guys to lie in relationships? Right? Are you seeing anybody else? Oh no, not me. Um, if everybody lies about that, the game falls apart. If some people lie about it, they get away with it. So the population as a whole will tolerate some subset of cheaters. Um, 
and you know, one can have the hope, the theoretical hope, that, uh, that you know, another few generations of, of work in the area and you'd be able to write the equation. You'll be able to say, look, a population like, uh, you know, an undergraduate population can tolerate 10% cheaters. If we've got 11% cheaters, we have to invoke, you know, the dean's office or something and, and, and throw them out because the population will crash otherwise or something. Anyway, we're nowhere near that point at this point. We can't write the equations. Um, but that seems to be the way you get to the solution to, um, to the problem that the theory at the moment predicts kind of everything. Um, the theory also doesn't predict the full range of behavior. I see I've got these problems listed on the handout. Um, in particular, <clears throat> it's explaining group behavior, explaining the behavior of individuals is something that I'll get to in the next lecture. Actually, I'll get to some of it later in the, in the present lecture. Um, and the third problem, let me say a bit about that before we take a, uh, a, a break, um, is that civilization may have changed the rules. One of the most uh, striking, uh, so there's several examples of this. One of them is... Um, you know, if you were operating in a sort of a purely Darwinian kind of a world, that would be very difficult, very, very difficult probably, but very different than operating in a world where you are being told explicitly what is and is not appropriate sexual behavior. You're being told explicitly um, if, uh, that, that, you know, your genes, your evolutionary history, if you're a male, may be saying, go off and mate with everybody under the sun. But there are uh, societal strictures that say, not really. You know, that's just not quite really right. Um, so that complicates things. But a more interesting complication um, arises more recently in, in, in history with the advent of um, artificial contraception. That, if, if the fundamental root to these asymmetries is that women get pregnant, you know, that sex makes you pregnant and it's only women that get pregnant, what happens if you decouple sex from pregnancy? Does it change the game? Well, potentially yes. It has not made these asymmetries disappear. Um, that's a, 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 a topic that, that I will actually return to in a later lecture. Um, it's not made these asymmetries disappear. And that suggests that the, the forces that, that shaped our, our brains, the evolutionary forces that shaped our brains over long periods of time, um, still operate even though the rules of the game have changed somewhat. And you, can, you can get an intuitive feeling for this. If you, if we, let's return to the question of female fidelity. Should a woman cheat? Well, part of the answer to why a female should, might be inclined not to cheat in a relationship was that the male might be jealous and that would have a variety of possible bad consequences, withdrawal of resources or potentially violence um, in some fashion. Something bad might happen. Okay, how much do you think that those bad consequences are ameliorated if when she's confronted, you know, did you cheat on me? Yes, I cheated on you, but it's okay because we took precautions. <laughs> Do you think that makes a difference in the argument? No, it doesn't. Intuitively, it doesn't seem likely that it makes a difference. Suggesting that the, the forces that are driving um, these questions of who should cheat and who shouldn't cheat um, are walled off from knowledge about modern contraception in sort of the way that, um, uh, that the forces that are driving taste aversions are walled off from what you know about what it is that made you sick. Remember from earlier in the course, you got sick because you got the flu, but you ate a tuna fish sandwich the day before you got the flu, and now you can't eat tuna fish anymore because um, this little chunk of brain said, tuna fish poisoned us, we never eat it again, <laughs> right? Same sort of story. Somewhere in the brain is a chunk of brain that is saying, you know, in a chunk of guy brain that is saying, need to know woman is faithful. Why? Well, because I need to know whose genes they are. Um, the woman isn't pregnant. I don't care. I, you know, this is, I, I'm a very simple little chunk of brain. I just need to know woman is faithful. Or I get, you know, I have unhappy things happen in me. Yeah, that's 
So the, the, the persistence of these sorts of asymmetries and these sorts of behaviors is another argument that can be used to argue that these are deep-seated um, behaviors with, with, with evolution. Oh, I should say, by the way, that these are explanations, not excuses in any way, shape, or form, right? Coming home and flipping to the other side of this, right? You're the guy this time. Did you cheat? Yes, but that's okay because I have deep-seated evolutionary forces within me that make it necessary for me to cheat. You know, that, that's an interesting explanation, but it's not an excuse in a relationship any more than it's an excuse, you know, uh, you know I, yes, I, 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 uh, I, I hit my girlfriend because I was jealous. You know, great. Lovely. We have these great evolutionary arguments for it. That's not an excuse. That's where you get into, again, why these things are politically controversial is the possibility of turning um, explanation into excuse. You can decide... Well, uh, to, to use an example that I will probably use uh, again, um, it's a little like saying, look, gravity is a force. You can't thwart gravity, so I'm just going to lie here forever. <laughs> right? You know, oops, lost the glasses. Where'd the glasses go? All right, you know, that's a really stupid argument. Um, and it's similarly stupid to say biology is a powerful force, therefore I had to do whatever. Yeah, there are other powerful forces out there and civilization, morality, culture, whatever are powerful forces and if they say don't do it it may be hard work not to do it but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it or you should do whatever you, you've got the basic idea um, well, on that sentence with way too many double negatives in it let us take a brief break and then I'll turn to the question of individual behavior two-part about it not uh, about these evolutionary theories not explaining the uh, the full range of behavior uh, well so you know th it explains you know perhaps the uh, the theory as, as elaborated thus far explains for instance why you might be attracted to one person or another but it doesn't explain what you do in any particular way. So, you know, you, you see an attractive uh, potential mate. You know, if you're a bird, you might do some sort of weird mating dance or something like that. Um, if, you're, you know, if you're a human, you might do some weird mating dance or something like that. Or, you know, the, 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 you can ask yourself about the range. What do you do if there's an attractive mate possibility? You could, uh, you know, you could, you could dance. You could hang around. You could act pathetic. Um, you could ask non-pathetic. You could get person A to talk to person B and, and who knows C, who's the uncle of D or something like that. Um, so, 
just knowing that there was evolutionary pressure here isn't really a, a, a full story about human mating behavior by any stretch of the imagination. Um, what's going to elaborate it on it? Uh, on it, you can probably get a good piece of mileage from uh, asking about law of effect kinds of things. What you do in mating situations or uh, courtship situations is going to be shaped um, at least in part by the schedule of reinforcement. Right? If something, you know, you do a mating dance and, and, and uh, the potential mate responds, you're going to be inclined to do that dance more. That's not why birds do it. Birds are wired typically to do the dance. But, you know, if you go off and do some weird dance and, and he or she says, hey, this is good, um, you know, you'll do it again. Uh, it, at the, uh, the whole, uh, I don't know, a ritual, I don't know what you want to call it, who touches who, when, where, and how, is also heavily shaped by law of effect sorts of things. You know, if it's rewarded, it happens again. If it's, if, if it's, if it's not rewarded, it doesn't happen again. Um, more on this later, but I did want to just say that, what, that there's nothing in the sort of evolutionary psych theory that really talks to that. Um, now, let me um, go on to try to say what does talk about um, individual behavior in, in romantic, uh, romantic relationships. Um, you know, to get beyond this notion of what, what average populations, uh, what average populations do. In a world full of potential mates, why are you attracted to this one now? You know, what's, wh- what can we say about that? Um, there, there, there certainly seems to be something to explain. There are a variety of candidate sorts of theories out there. Um, one of them is nicely encapsulated in, um, uh, in Shakes. Oh, I, I realize I didn't put the most clear-cut piece of uh, uh, citation on that quote at the bottom of page three. That's Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. And Shakespeare has Theseus, Duke of Athens, say that lovers and madmen have such seething brains such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. This is a theory of romantic behavior that says you're attracted to whom you're attracted to at the moment and you're doing what you're doing in response to that now because you're nuts. I mean, basically, it's a form of insanity. Um... And not uncommon uh, theory in, in, in literary, that, that shows up in literary circles. And you may have um, it, the, the place to get some intuitive uh, feeling for that is to remember what it felt like um, if you were ever completely infatuated with somebody. Preferably somebody who didn't know you were infatuated with them. Right? At, you know, some random other person in across the you know, crowded room kind of thing. Um, you know, that has the feeling of being more or less out of your mind, which you don't realize at the time. Um, and reams of bad high school poetry are written under those <laughs> conditions. Um, and if you're very lucky, uh, nobody else gets to see that stuff, mostly. Um, the... In, in, my, in my experience, so back, back when I was in high school, how many people have ever seen a book called Jonathan Livingston Seagull? Oh, it's still out there. It's, an, it's, it's, it's very sappy. Um, and it was the sort of thing you gave to somebody who you were deeply in love with, preferably in high school. Um, and it turns out that both my wife and I have copies of this book given to us by people other than each other, because we didn't know each other in high school, both with inscriptions so florid that you, know, you, you just can't read them. Uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're quite amazing. One of these, I mean, why haven't we destroyed them? Well, there's a certain nostalgia there of some sort, and all, you, 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 you've got to save these things for your children. One day... You know, you're, my, one of my kids is going to be up in the attic and find this thing and read it and, and fall down dead laughing. Um, <laughs> but, um, all right. But the, the, the relevant question here is, that's not a bad theory. Um, 
why don't we, t- why isn't this the abnormal psych part of the course? Why aren't we talking about love in the context of psychopathology? What's the answer? Nobody knows what the answer is. How do you, yeah? Psychopathology generally deals with things that are for smaller yeah, there's a reason it's called abnormal psychology as a, as a, as a possible. Now, look, if, if I don't know quite what would happen if um, you know if bad people found a way to put something in the water that made us all uh, floridly schizophrenic. If it became the majority state, it would still be um, psychopathological, probably. But by and large, what we talk about in abnormal psychology is abnormal and. Uh, being in love may be a sort of insanity, but it's a very... Well, look, Shakespeare knew this too. So if we borrow from As You Like It, we have the explanation of uh, this given in this case by Rosalind. Rosalind in, 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 uh, in, in As You Like It saying that, that love is merely madness, merely a madness, and I tell you, deserves a dark house and a whip as madmen do, which tells you something about Elizabethan psychotherapy. Um, the reason they are not so punished and cured which also tells you something about Elizabethan psychotherapy the notion was not that you were just being nasty to crazy people but that being nasty was curative Um, the reason they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too it doesn't make any real sense. To just, it's not a useful theory to say that, that being in love is, is a form of insanity because it, it's a sen- essentially a universal form of insanity. Um, you might think that there's nothing much to say in an intro psych class about this at all and that the whole topic is kind of best left to Shakespeare and, and, and other literary sources. And that's an, actually not a bad argument. Um, but I think there is something... Uh, useful to be said in the context of psychology. Um, you could, you could, we can switch back to Shakespeare and ask. Uh, how are I, I, wait, wait. First, we have to check on how high school education is going these days. How many people had to read Romeo and Juliet in high school somewhere? Oh, okay, good. Just checking. Um, so, uh, you know, Romeo is looking across a crowded uh, a dance hall here. Um, and he sees um, uh, he, he sees Juliet, and he's supposed to be in love with Rosaline. Good, you got that question right on the test. Um, right, he's, he's he's been mooning around about this woman, Rosaline. He walks in, he sees Juliet, and it's you know, oh, she doth make the toy teach. teach blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you can see why I'm not a Shakespearean actor. She doth teach the torches to burn bright, and 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 all that good stuff. Um, you know. Why? What can what can you uh, what can you say about it? There are a variety of things. Well, we could we could develop what we could call the chemical theory of love here. We've, we've passed through the insanity theory. Let's work on the chemical theory a little bit. Um, chemical theory gets you a, a, a certain uh, distance. Oh, I didn't put this on the handout yet because I wasn't convinced I was going to get here. So the, the the I'll put a few of these terms on there next time. But you can you can write on the back of the handout. So uh, chemical aspects. One thing that's uh, related to chemical aspects is, uh, is the proximity factor. You want to get two things to, uh, to, you know, to, to interact and make, make heat, you got to bring them together, right? It sounds trivial, but um, well, the scary version of this is that a, a, a not uh, insignificant number of you will meet your uh, eventual mate here, not here like in 10 to 50 right now, but, but um, during your undergraduate years um, at, uh, at MIT. And so, you know, somebody, somebody in this room may be that person or something like that. One of the reasons is it's a great deal easier to fall in love with somebody you actually interact with. There are lovely people at Caltech, I'm told. Um, but mostly... <laughs> No? Well, there are bitter, jealous, d- disappointed people at Caltech, I'm told, all of whom actually wanted to go to MIT. Um, but anyway, you see the point. Um, the other, so, so proximity helps. Now, another, another chemical aspect of, of um, 
the, 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 this romantic love business um, is that if you want a chemical reaction to speed up, um, one of the things that's useful to do is to add heat, right? Um, that, that, works, that works too. Um, and it works in... Um, not, not, not just like turning up the thermostat, but um, you are more likely to fall in love with somebody um, uh, if your arousal level is up. That seems pretty obvious. The non-obvious piece of it is that you're pretty stupid about this and you don't care too much where the arousal comes from. The Romeo and Juliet thing is not a bad example. Uh, Romeo is which family? Montague. Montague, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Ma, ma, uh, Romeo is at whose party? Do they want him at this party? What are they going to do if they find him? Yeah, so how does that make him feel? He's, he's, his, his level of arousal. His, his little heart is going pitter pat, right? Um, and there is some sense in which that contributes to, uh, th- th- that, that modulates how attractive you think somebody else is. Um, the, the, the example in, the, 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 the clearest pop culture example of this is ask yourself about the standard adventure movie paradigm. It's got a guy, it's got a girl, right? Do they like each other at the beginning of the movie? No. no. What do they do for the duration of the movie? They find themselves in disastrous situations after, after disastrous situation. What, do they like each other during the movie? No, no, they spend the whole movie sniping each, each other and, and, and double-crossing each other and stuff like that. The end of the movie, they're both hanging by one fingernail from the helicopter over the volcano <laughs> or something like that. And what do they realize? We're in love! You know, this is great. Um, It sounds silly, but the fact that we have been willing to tolerate that plot line forever suggests that there's there's something to it. There is even... uh, Okay, I got enough time to tell you about what is arguably one of the great experiments in in, uh, experimental psychology. Did I already tell you about the Shaky Bridge experiment? No, good. Um... The, uh, it's a, this is an experiment so good that I did a pilgrimage to the place where it was done, um, which turns out to be in Vancouver. Vancouver has um, a, a, a park with a deep gorge and, and a Raiders of the Lost Ark style suspension bridge going across it. Or Shrek, you know, with the, not Shrek, Shrek, yeah, with the, mon- the donkey going across it. You know, you know the bridge. No volcanoes and dragons or anything, but it's a shaky bridge. Here's what they did. You're a guy for this experiment. You're a guy and um, you are walking across this shaky bridge and in the middle of the bridge you meet a woman. Um, And she says, I'm doing a study for psychology. Would you fill out my little questionnaire? All right. Okay. You know, as part of the processes of this, blah, 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 blah. If you want to know more about this experiment, um, once we've collected the data, um, you can uh, phone me at this number at the lab. My name is uh, Sarah. Okay? So, that's group one. Group two, turns out, round the corner from this shaky bridge, there's another bridge over the same river. It's a big concrete slab. It don't shake at all. <laughs> You're a different white guy. Uh, do you a white guy? I don't remember if you're a white guy. You're a guy. Um, you're walking across the bridge and, and you meet uh, a, a, a woman. And same story. Um, if you're interested in the results of this experiment, um, uh, phone this number and ask for Rebecca. Needless to say, Rebecca and Sarah are the same person. The only thing that differs is whether you met her on a, um, the shaky bridge or on the non-shaky bridge. The data are who calls, right? So you call up the number. Some guy answers. You know, you say, is uh, Rebecca there? And uh, he says, no, no, I'll take a message and hangs up the phone. Another one for Rebecca. (laughs) Um, It turns out that more guys who met Sarah on the shaky bridge phone in than who met Rebecca on the solid bridge. 
Why is that? The argument, the, 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 this, this arousal heat argument is, it's, it's known in the trade as misattribution of arousal. You walk across the bridge, you meet a woman person, um, you ask yourself, how do I feel? My heart is beating. My palms are sweaty. It must be love. <laughs> um, and it's enough of an effect to change whether or not you'll phone up to get the results of the uh, um, to get the results of the uh, experiment. Look, you shouldn't overstress the result. Um, nobody's done this particular experiment, but if you meet a chicken in the middle of the bridge, you don't say, "My heart is beating, my palms are sweaty, I love the chicken." It, 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 but it does modulate things now.